Welcome back. In the first section, we looked at the landscape for add-on instructions in the RS Logic 5000 uh, world. Now we're going to look at the actual geography of an add-on instruction. Specifically, how do we get data into and out of an add-on instruction? And namely, we're going to talk terminology. The primary term for routines or add-on instruction is an argument. And I suppose that the term argument originated as one side of a logical debate or a value in an equation. In computer science, an argument is a value used to evaluate a procedure or subroutine. This is much closer to our use in this presentation. And an argument can contain any of the following. In RS Logix 5000 terms, it could be a simple tag. And remember, a tag, tag name, pointer, um, points to a memory location where there is a value stored. So temp01, that could be temperature1, is a pointer that points to the memory location where you would find a floating point, a real, a double integer, a value that represents a temperature. So this argument, and, and keep in mind, let's say we had an add-on instruction that was going to calculate volume of a rectilinear device, like a cube or a rectangle. There would be three arguments, height, width, and depth. You would multiply those three values together and come up with a result. So the, the arguments for that routine would be height, width, and depth. How we get those values into that equation or into that routine is determined by whether it's in, by reference or by actual value. But anyway, so an argument could be a simple tag. It could be a literal value, like a constant. It could be a tag structure reference. Now, if you're not familiar with RS Logix 5000, then this doesn't mean anything to you yet. However, the uh, argument that you're looking at, cylinder dot extended, extended is an element in the data structure cylinder. So if you think of a cylinder in terms of different pieces of data, you've got extended retract. So it's you told it to extend, you told it to retract, it's extended or retracted or it's neither or it's both. So in the data type cylinder, extended would be one reference within that tag structure cylinder. It could be a direct array reference, meaning it is referring to the element 11 of the tag row. So that's a single dimension array called row. So if you have a row of cartons, the first carton would be 0, the second one 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and so on. So it's a direct array reference referring to the 12th element or element 11 of the tag array row. It could also be an indirect array reference. And in this case, if the index was 10, then it would still be row and element 11. So you can actually index this reference with an index value or it could be a combination of a indirect array reference and a tag structure reference. Typically it's going to be a simple tag or a literal value. An argument is a value used directly as such or by reference. It is a constant or a variable. So this will take the uh, little routine we were talking about to calculate volume for a rectangle or a cube. Now if it was a cube then all three dimensions are identical and you would only need one argument to calculate the volume of a cube. But in the case of a rectangular container the height, width, 
and depth could all be the same or they could be different. If you pass an argument into the routine that is an actual value, a constant, then once the values are passed into the routine, it's executed and the result is going to be volume. But if you pass it in by reference, then it actually has to read the tag that is referred to. So you want to keep these two ideas in mind, reference or by value. If you look at this instruction, this is an on-delay timer. And if not already apparent, the function of parameters will become clear before long. Parameters are the data ports into and out of an add-on instruction. If you think of parameters in terms of an instruction that you are already familiar with, like this on-delay timer instruction, it may help you better place this into context. Now look at the TON instruction. How many parameters do you see? Three. There are actually four that you can see, and there's a fifth that is usable but is not on display here. The timer field, or the name of the timer, is not a parameter. It is a field to create an instance of the timer data type and name it. The preset, the accumulate, or accum, the enable bit, and the done bit are parameters because they are accessible to code in the general program. There's another one, timer timing, or the TT bit. You might even go as far as to say that the enable and done bits are visible but not required. And if you've used um, 500, 5000, or even um, RSLogix 2 or RSLogix 5, the enable and done bits are on display here to help you troubleshoot. You don't actually attach additional code to the enable or the done bit graphics here. They're just displayed to help you as actually the preset and accumulate. That way when you're looking at the logic, you can see what the preset of the timer is and the accumulate of the timer. Now the preset, accumulate, and enable are actually required and the done bit because you need those to operate the instruction. You just keep this in mind and eventually it'll make more sense. Parameters are the data portals in and out of the add-on instructions. And they are, parameters are to the add-on instruction what COM ports and backplane are to the controller. So within the controller to execute the code, if you want to think of the controller as one giant add-on instruction, the only way that that controller can do anything worthwhile is if it accesses external data and provides results externally. And that would be through the COM ports in the back plane of the controller. So if you want to think of an add-on instruction as a, not a controller or a macro controller or a mini controller, but as a microcontroller. Here we have a complete diagram for a programmable logic controller not a programmable automation controller that uses the Logix engine, but the older family of processors. We have memory, RAM, and in there we see the basic structure for Slick 500 MicroLogix. We have output and input tags, we have timers, counters, control, we have an integer and a floating point, and then we have ladder 2, which is the actual program. Notice we also have S2, the status file. And to and from memory is controlled by the CPU. And of course the CPU kind of has a supervisor called firmware. And then it has an IO structure or chipset that can handle data either through communications or through the backplane. And of course the CPU is the hub of the system and there are two categories of data transferring in and out of this process. So the primary source of data when the PLC is actually executing the code is the backplane. The I.O. modules electrically interface the field devices such as photo eyes, proximity switches, push buttons, etc. 
through the back plane from which the controller extracts the status of any input devices and through which the controller delivers updates to control the actual output devices. In this case, um, the back plane, of course, is populated with a large variety of I.O. cards, I.O. modules, electrical interfaces between field devices and the back plane. Now, if you would like a little further elaboration on the active back plane illustrated here, it's called active because the CPU through the control bus actively or you could say activates one slot at a time either to read data in or to write data to the electronic switching of the module. If you want more information on this there is a couple segments in the lecture series on the PLC Professor YouTube channel that go into quite a bit of detail on the active backplane. So let's not get sidetracked from add-on instructions. Other than the backplane, data can be transferred into and out of the memory through the communications ports referred to in this diagram as channel 0 and channel 1. These ports can be connected to a variety of devices. However, let's um, pick the simple, most conventional and HMI, human machine interface, and a lot laptop for programming. So here we have Pete Panel View and Larry Laptop. Uh, typically uh, either can be plugged into either channel 0 or channel 1. Channel 0 uh, on, in this family of processors is RS-232. Now remember RS-232 is an electrical specification, not a data specification. It's not a protocol. So RS-232 just means that it it's uh, high and lows, it's voltage levels that determine the binary structure are specified electrically by voltage levels. The actual protocol for channel 0 is DF1. Channel 1, depending on the particular processor, now here it shows a SLUC 503 for CPU, uh, that's DH485, Data Highway 485. If this were a 504, then channel 1 would be Data Highway Plus. If this were a 505, uh, channel 1 would be Ethernet. So, if you wanted to think of the controller as a giant add-on instruction, the parameters, you would have input and output parameters, and you would have in-out parameters. Primarily, the parameters would be tags in memory that reference data that comes from the backplane or tag names that whose data are sent out to the backplane to the output modules. Uh, the HMI, the panel view, can directly access tags or pointers, memory locations, to change the data and to read the data. So in this case it would make almost every single memory location in that controller's memory a parameter. And of course from the laptop you can also change the values directly. Now the timers and counters and other data types in there that are not changed by the back plane or directly by the panel view. Now you can edit them uh, from the panel view if you make them accessible. But typically we would think of those as local tags, internal tags. So all of your addresses like B3, 0, uh, timers, counters, control, integers, and floating points, not the I.O. If you look down at the bottom of your memory there, you've got O0 and I1. Those tags or registers are controlled by parameters. So all the rest of it you could kind of say is like local tags. So when you think of an add-on instruction and that add-on instruction has code encapsulated in it and it occupies space and memory, that in that little piece of memory that goes along with that add-on instruction You've got parameters that go in and out, and then you've got 
data that is controlled solely within the add-on instruction, those are called local tags. So the data structures updated by the I.O. scan or by the HMI are parameters in the context of treating the controller as just one big add-on instruction. A little more on terminology and it is very key that you focus in on the difference between input parameter and out parameter versus in out parameter. An in out parameter defines data that can be used as both input and output data during the execution of the instruction because in out parameters are always passed by reference their values can change from external sources during the execution of the add-on instruction. Now with the older PLCs, those with an active backplane like PLC 2, 3, 4, 5, SLIC 500, MicroLogics, once the first rung of logic was executed, the backplane had no further effect on memory values until the program scan finished and the next I.O. scan begun. And really the communication ports uh, partially fall in the same category. This is because a standard PLC cannot chew gum and walk at the same time, whereas with a passive backplane like Control Logics, the 1756 chassis, where each I.O. card is a computer in its own right, and it communicates its data across the backplane to the memory of the controller while the controller is executing code. So what comes over the back plane in a 1756 chassis really is in out parameters because they can change while the code is executing. So for an add-on instruction, in out parameters that you're and, and you you're using these and executing the code inside the add-on instruction they can actually change from the time that you started executing the add-on instruction until you've completed the execution of that one instance. So you can't depend on those values to stay the same all the way through execution of the add-on instruction. So in-out parameters are always passed by reference and not value. All the re although the reference, reference will have a value, so in-out parameters refer to a tag out in the general population in the controller. And these tags are available to all the code in the controller, not just the add-on instruction. So the other form that we have, um, let's look at those. We have an input parameter. This defines data that is passed by value into the executing instruction because input parameters are always passed by value, their values cannot change from external sources during the execution of the code. Whereas in out parameters referred to a tag out in the general tag population, this type of parameter reads the tag or value at the beginning of the execution of the add-on instruction and it does not change during the execution. The value is passed in from that tag and then accessed during the execution of the code in the add-on instruction. Once it's passed in by value, that value is used throughout execution of the add-on instruction. Whereas if it's referred by reference, each time it's used, it refers to the tag out in the general population. And then we have output parameters defines data that is produced as a direct result of executing the instruction. Because output parameters are always passed by value, their values cannot change from external sources during the execution of the code in the add-on instruction. So remember the difference. In-out parameters are tags outside of the add-on instruction, and the add-on instruction, when it uses those parameters accesses to what they refer to out in the general tag population. Whereas input parameters and output parameters, the data is transferred in. Now it might still be a tag name. The difference is 
in in out parameters you bring in the tag name as the argument with input parameters and output parameters you bring in the value from the tag as the argument Once again, pass by reference. When an argument is passed to a parameter by reference, the logic directly reads or writes the value that the tag uses in the controller memory. Because the add-on instruction is acting on the same tag memory as the argument, other code or HMI interaction that changes the argument's value can change the value while the add-on instruction is executing. So if, you, if you're using um, arguments passed by reference and you're assuming that once you go into the add-on instruction, you're executing the code, that that argument will not change, you're mistaken. So if you don't want the argument to change, then you need to use input parameters and output parameters, not in-out parameters. And you'll notice that you can configure them any way you want when we're actually creating this add on instruction that we're going to create later on. So pass by reference, the arguments values can change while the add on instruction is executing. However, pass by value, when an argument is passed to a parameter by value, the value is copied in or out of the parameter when the add on instruction executes. Therefore, the value of the argument does not change from external code or HMI interaction outside of the add-on instruction. You may have to review this several times and play with it before you uh, actually get it firmly placed in your mind. But I think you can see the difference. In one case, you're bringing in a value from a tag. That value is not going to change because you're not referring to the tag again. You're using the value. Whereas when you're referencing a tag, every time you use that argument, that the value of that argument is out in the general population where it can be changed by any other code in the controller. This concludes this segment, Geography of an Add-on Instruction. The next section, or the next segments, will be the sequence of creating add-on instructions.